in dealing with products, you have such a high risk of hurting someone or or someone's property, like burning a home down or, um, you know, a child choking on a piece of, of, of a puzzle or whatever it might be, that you really are opening yourself up for some some real nightmares in the event that you don't have coverage. Welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we have a very special guest because if you love your business or even if you just want to make sure that nothing goes wrong with it, you're going to want to hear what Michelle has to say today. We have a wonderful guest for you, and she's going to talk about all the wonderful things that you can do to protect your business, aka insurance. Wah, wah, wah. I know it's not a sexy topic. No one likes to hear about insurance. As a matter of fact, most of you are probably already trying to swipe off of this podcast and listen or watch something else because you're like, oh, who wants to talk about insurance? However, if you have been paying attention to the world and the universe lately, there's been a lot of natural disasters going on. There's been tons of, um, tornadoes and things that hit the Kentucky area, the, the mid South east of the country and there's been lots of wildfires out west and there's always hurricanes or hurricane season is is past right now but all of these different things that we don't really think of and we think oh yeah well wouldn't amazon just protect our stuff because it's in their warehouse um the truth might shock you and surprise you and also the affordability of insurance but also did you know then Amazon requires this. If you are a third party seller on Amazon, they require it. But first, before we get to talking to Michelle, um, I have some few, a few announcements. Uh, we just recently got back from our amazing Atlanta workshop and I met some of you guys there and I am just still over the moon about all the different ideas and different things that have come along the way since then. And we have released all of the new options for 2022. So if you're considering coming to a workshop, I'd love to meet you. I want to meet you. I would love to be able to, um, raise a toast and talk to the, talk with you and have a drink with you and teach you all about wholesale bundles so that you can have a rock star year. So we've released some new dates. Our newest one is coming up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's going to be a trade show walkthrough and VIP party only. It's not a workshop, but um, for those of you who would like to do just a quick trade show walkthrough, something smaller, something a little bit less overwhelming than say Atlanta or Dallas or LA, then um, please come and join me in Grand Rapids. It's going to be um, just a half a day of us getting together and walking through the trade show and learning about vendors and talking to them and getting their catalogs and starting to order products for wholesale bundles. So it's going to be a really exciting time there. Then we're going to LA in um, April and that's going to be fun there too. Minneapolis in the fall and there's going to be a special mommy income retreat coming up this year. Why? Because we all need a retreat. After the few years that we've had, we need a rest. We need a recharge. We need a retreat. So that includes fun. That includes working. That includes one-on-one sessions, but it also includes a lot of self-care and things like that with other like-minded people. So if you're interested in a retreat, that is an option to join the waiting list as well there. So go to mommyincome.com slash workshop and make sure you're signing up for that. So Now I'm going to introduce you to my guest here. Michelle has been in insurance for almost 30 years. That is a long time. And she's been doing, she specializes in uh, multiple different ways, but specifically with e-commerce accounts. That's why she is with us today. She is with EM Ford Insurance in Kentucky, and she's got a lot of things to say. The unique approach that she has really is that she has been, uh, her and her daughter have been private label Amazon sellers, and she's been an e-commerce seller since 2003. So her and I go way back when it comes to being in e-commerce, because we both started the same year, nearly two decades ago. She can speak about Amazon e-commerce and insurance languages. She understands what your business looks like and what your needs are. And she can talk about the, the private label stuff, wholesale bundling, even retail arbitrage protections and all of the different requirements. So welcome Michelle to the show. So welcome Michelle. I'm so glad that you're here and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks Kristen for having me. I'm very excited and just love your energy and what you're doing to help other um, sellers, especially women sellers, and um, just very excited and 
um, eager to, to help your, your group in, in their insurance journey. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about, I know you have e-commerce and Amazon uh, experience and background. So tell us a little bit about that from a seller's perspective, and then we'll get into the insurance. Okay. Um, well, my daughter and I started a uh, e-commerce store when she was 16. So that's been about, gosh, almost seven, eight years ago now. And mainly because we couldn't find some things for her sweet 16 birthday party. So we started an events kind of uh, themed area um, and just, it kind of took off from there. Uh, she has now graduated college. And so I'm focusing a little more toward the wholesale bundling, you know, replans type of, of on, on the e-commerce side um, when I have time. But then, um, you know, she will eventually, after she gets settled with her career, it, she'll take part of that over or, or spin it off and do something on her own with it. So, um, yeah, so that's how we got started. Um, as far as Amazon, no, I've been selling on eBay since 2003, so um, long time. Yeah, you and I go way back. That's the same year I started as well. So you're looking at like, we're almost 20 year vets when it comes to e-commerce. So everything from eBay, Amazon, and probably everything in between. Um, yeah. And because of that, you know, building all these businesses, taking so long and, and so much effort and time and money that people put into this. Now we all know, like we've seen commercials on TV, you can cue the eye roll here for like, you know, all the different commercials that are out there about, you know, insurance and protecting your business and protecting all of your assets and things, but I think it's just one of those things that people don't like to think about and talk about or spend money on until it's too late, until it's necessary. And then it's like, by then it's too late. So I know that there are some requirements when it comes to insurance and with Amazon. And, you know, before we even get into that, the the importance of protecting your business and protecting your assets, not just to be compliant with Amazon, I think is just so underrated. So can you talk a little bit about um, maybe some of even the problems you've seen with the uninsured and, and what they have gone through because of the lack of insurance that they have? Yeah, and, and I agree with you 100%. I mean, I, I'm not one that is a hard seller or thinks, you know, people need insurance when they really don't. Um, but in dealing with products, you have such a high risk of hurting someone or, or someone's property, like burning a home down or, um, you know, a child choking on a piece of, of, of a puzzle or whatever it might be, that you really are opening yourself up for some, some real nightmares in the event that you don't have coverage. Um, and, you know, we, you know, luckily, um, we don't have many experiences with claims in this area. Um, I do in plenty of other areas in regards to insurance. Um, but one of the biggest, one of the biggest benefits with having insurance in place is it covers your legal fees. And in 90% of the time, you know, that's a bigger payout than someone might get in, you know, if in a, you know, a suit against something hurting, you know, their carpet or whatever it might be. Um, so the legal fees can be very, very high and the insurance policies are there to cover those as well. So when you say the legal fees, when, when you're talking about a benefit for say someone like me, is it if I'm being sued or if I'm suing someone else? If you're being sued, so your policy would then come into play to defend you, um, try to get you out of it, try to reduce any settlement, any sort of claim activity there. Um, you know, all the insurance companies hire their own attorneys for various types of claims. And with that being said, you know, those costs are pretty high. Um, so, it's, it's just there to protect you because that's part of your claim payout is the legal fees and then any indemnity or settlement type payment. That is so good to know. Okay, so what kind of insurance does Amazon require? Amazon requires a $1 million general liability and product liability policy. Um, they have they have changed their requirements in the last year a little bit, um, but that that limit is 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 constant. It's been there since I started this journey back six or seven years ago and signed up to be a seller. Um, it was in your terms of of um, agreement or um, you know. So you, everyone that signs that 
has already agreed that they will maintain whether you've met that 10,000 um, in sale, gross sales in a month threshold that Amazon is now putting out there on all sellers. Um, they used to just put that on the um, individual sellers um, and, and it was, you needed it from day one if you were a professional seller. So if you were paying the $39.99 you know, a month fee to Amazon, you were required by your terms of service to have the coverage from day one. Whereas if you were just an individual seller, not you know formalized, then you were um, not required until you reached $10,000 in sales over three months. So now they've made it across the board and it's 10,000 over a 30 day period. And they're sending letters out, which is really um, making a lot of people very nervous. Yeah. Well, recently, you know, this is typical Amazon, you know, we've been around the block, you know, almost two decades now we understand that Amazon always has a lot of these policies. And, and then when they get sued for something, then they realize they need to start enforcing these policies. And we know over the past three or four years, Amazon has been sued for multi-million dollars for all kinds of reasons, even just being part of a supply chain. Some of it was their own products they were being sued for or whatever the, the case may be. They really decided that they were tired of um, fighting other people's battles in court, and they have now uh, are now starting to enforce this policy, even though yeah. it's been in place for since as, as long as I can remember being a pro seller, it's been a requirement. Yes, and it has, and and within the policy um, requirements, you also name as as the seller, you would name Amazon.com, um, and their whole um, their whole list there as an additional insured. So what that does is that gives pop that gives coverage back to Amazon from your policy, um, which helps in the event that because if 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 you as a seller are sued, Amazon's also going to be listed in that suit, but their coverage is going to come from your policy, not theirs. Yeah. And that's that is very typical. That's the same as if you know you are leasing a space in a building um, and you have to name the landlord as an additional insured and there's, you know, a hole in the floor and somebody falls Well, they're going to name, you know, you as the tenant, but also the landlord. It's the same thing. It's very common, very normal business practice. Now, recently, one of my clients had come to me and they had mentioned that, you know, that the the tragedy that even happened really close to your area in Kentucky, where all of the, those tornadoes had hit and they hit an Amazon warehouse. And, um, you know, unfortunately, people lost their lives and lots of people lost their jobs and a place to work, but also all the inventory that was stole was stored there is now destroyed. And so people were coming out of the word woodwork and Amazon saying, well, what's going to happen to my inventory? Am I protected? Am I covered? Are they going to cover that? Are they responsible? And I'm sure you can give us some insight on who is responsible for what. And in those cases, because I think it surprises most people. It does. And, um, and you and I have not discussed this, but that's a great very timely um, question. Um, I was actually impacted because that's one of my fulfillment centers I actually send things to. So I've been redirected to another one for um, a short time. Um, the, the general rule is if you are a seller and you send your things to the, the fulfillment center, if you're doing FBA, then Amazon has your products in their care custody and control, and they have coverage for those products. And they know exactly, we all know the, the intricacies of their um, inventory management systems, but they know exactly what you have in that warehouse. And that's uh, my understanding, unless I'm told differently, and that's what it shows in the terms of, con of the, the terms of service, that if it's in their care, custody, and control, their policy would cover the cost of your products. Now, if you are self um, warehousing your products, or if you're um, even in certain cases, if you're using a third party fulfillment, um, you know, a, you know, maybe a, 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 a prep, prep center, center. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, a prep center of some sort, um, you know, it, it, you would have to really look at the contract to know if they have coverage on your goods or if you need to cover those as well. So, um, you know, we're getting a lot of requests for that type of coverage because of the small business loans that people are taking out and they're requiring 
product, product physical property coverage. And so we can add that coverage in addition to the liability that Amazon requires. So other than the liability, does Amazon require you um, any other specific um, insurance to have on your products? No, uh, just the product and general liability coverage. That's all that's required. Um, they, um, you know, there are other sell, there are other um, platforms that you can sell on that require higher limits than the 1 million that Amazon requires. Um, for example, Chewy or Walmart.com, um, they begin at 2 million. So we would in that instance place an umbrella for another $1 million coverage limit to go over top of the 1 million general limit. Um, so we can we can do those sorts of things. And I'm pretty versed in what um, what each platform requires. But Amazon right now is just 1 million product and general liability. So what happens if you like, you know, you and I, we do a lot of private label items. I do a lot of wholesale bundles, which some of them are my private label product and some of them are wholesale and even, you know, people doing retail arbitrage or online arbitrage. So are they required to have liability insurance or even insurance for doing retail arbitrage? Yeah. If you're a seller on Amazon, you, you, you fall under this requirement. You absolutely are. Um, the difference there. There are two different types of rating that we use in insurance, and it's there's a huge difference if you're private labeling or if you're doing any of the others. Mm -hmm. um, wholesale, RA, OA, you know, that's all under one category, and then you have private label. So the rates are higher for the insurance on private label products because you are considered the manufacturer. In the event of the others, then you're, you know, you're selling, you know, Hans ketchup or you're selling Dove soap. And in the event that there's a claim, you know, they they will both be, you will both be named in that lawsuit. So it's, you know, they, you can go up in the claims on that to the to the actual manufacturer. But you're considered the manufacturer under the um, private label scenario. So what if in the, in the instance, this is just this curiosity because a lot of our listeners here are wholesale bundlers and maybe one of their items is private labeled and they're actually putting their own brand on, on things, not everything that's in the package, but like for a gift set, for example, um, mm -hmm. in a bundle situation, I have Kristen's favorite things as the brand and manufacturer of the product, but then there's products within that that are manufactured by other people. So when, when we're insuring ourselves, am I insuring? that whole thing because I'm considered the manufacturer of this particular product or is it, it that's just more of a private label thing so I'm taking on all the responsibility of that or is that also kind of a it depends situation well in that instance you would fill out like our application has a place for you to put your private label sales gross sales and your all other gross sales mm -hmm. so in in a bundle where you have one private label and two um, OA items, then, you know, you would have maybe $3 in your private label and you may have $5 in your RA. So you're, you have $8 total gross sales, but it's three and five. So it, it's rated basically on what is, what is considered private label and what is considered not private label. And I've heard that there's higher rates for things that are ingestible or topical, you know, like any creams, anything that goes on your body or in your body, which is why I stay away from most of these things um, selling on Amazon. So those are significantly higher. Am I right? You are. And you are exactly right. Um, they are what we call higher risk. Um, we have to go in most cases to a specialty market which, you know, I have, I have some really good companies that I go to that I can direct these direct, you know, to them um, that are very familiar with e-commerce now because I've sent them so much, um, so many things to ensure. But if you are, you know, in that baby pet, ingestibles, topicals, anything medical device, even, you know, an ice pack, you wouldn't think that's a medical device, but that is. Um, anything that's durable medical equipment, even as minor as, as a blue ice pack you would put on your arm. Um, all of that is higher risk and we have to go to the, the other markets. Um, and 
this is going to get really complicated, but Amazon finally, after my pleading and pleading and pleading with the risk management department to um, adjust their requirements to allow for what we call claims made policies, um, because all of those types of high risk type um, products are written on a claims made insurance policy. They're not written on an occurrence and that's all the verbiage that Amazon had in their terms of service. And we would submit a certificate of insurance. We have, you know, you have two boxes, one's occurrence and one's claims made, and we would check claims made and it would get kicked back from Amazon, said it's not compliant. But there's no policy in the world that allows baby or topicals or ingestibles on a, an occurrence form. The reason is there's a long tail coverage and, and that means a, like a child, especially with children. So any type of child product, you know, until they reach the age of majority, they can still sue. So there's a long, there's a long area that of time that can be a claim can be made. And occurrence policy, like if you're doing, you know, um, Kristen's bundles, and it's all like, maybe you're doing stationary stuff. That's occurrence because you don't really have a lot of tail, long time tail coverage. And if there's a claim, there's gonna be a claim when someone cuts their finger on opening the package. That's an occurrence. So we don't have to account for a long tail coverage. If, and that gets really deep into it. But um, Amazon, I was very lucky to be able to um, have them add that verbiage to allow certain categories like, your, like we were just discussing to be written on a claims made policy and um, and it's been much easier on us as insurance agents. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of us have, you know, I wouldn't have never known the difference to be able to ask for that. You know, we don't really know, but I can see, I can certainly see the understanding of that. If somebody, you know, has a, uh, you know, like I'm guessing, you know, I'm trying to, to understand all this. So if somebody, you know, breaks their leg and then they have this long-term type of problem after the product that maybe is that, is that kind of what it means is that after that, there couldn't be complications that come up later that's due to that injury. And that's still the obligation of the person that was responsible for that um, to continually take care of that. And that's exactly right. Um, if you can kind of think of medical malpractice policies, those are all on a claims made policy. So because there could be complications down the road um, versus lower risk, lower, you know, type of, of risk type policies or products. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's why a lot of people will ask me, is there any categories I stay away from? And they think more of like Amazon competition and profit margin. And I always think of liability. Like I literally do not want to be sued for anything. And these days I feel like everybody thinks that there's a lawsuit about something. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it just has to do with more of the entitlement of era that we're living in. I think we've all gotten a little spoiled and think that, you know, all of these things, I don't know, I'm not going to make it. Uh, ideas about that. But I do know that those are many, there's a lot of Sue happy people in um, at least our country. And because of that, a good insurance and a good lawyer is always something every business should have on hand. Yeah. And that goes back to that whole legal, the legal expenses, because anyone can sue you for anything. There could be absolutely no justification to a suit, but you still have to, as an insured and as an insurance company protecting you, um, pay those lawyers to fight that claim. And, and that is part of your insurance policy. That's part of your coverage. Yeah. I know a lot of people have been talking lately about, oh, well, I've got this new supplement or this new protein powder or this new this, and I want to launch that on Amazon. And I just get so nervous. I, I try and, I mean, I want people, I want to support people's ideas, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. If somebody's ingesting something like I'm scared. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, you know, we do have insurance companies that we can use to write the insurance to protect those people that want to go in that direction. Um, usually those are, you know, your higher level, higher sales, you know, million and above a lot of times um, because they've tested the market somehow or another and they're, they're going all in and really making a splash with, with a product because they've got so much invested. Um, so those people are, you know, have a higher sales um, gross sales estimate, um, and then therefore 
you know, really, really have the need for the insurance, even though they really do from day one. So I understand, like, I, I know that a lot of people are thinking, oh, there's so much cost involved in this, but really, in, at least in recent years, I have noticed that there's a lot of policies that are extremely affordable, even as, as I've seen them as least expensive as $400 all the way up to like $1,400 and, and up depending on, you know, different policies and stuff. But for your average, like, you know, seller who's maybe selling a hundred to 200,000 revenue a year in insurance, um, maybe not high risk items. You're just average seller. Can we get a ballpark of about how much people look to invest in that? Yeah, I just pulled a couple of policies um, that I'm actually going to order tonight when I get home. Um, but they range from of the ones that are um, non private label. Um, we're looking at depending on um, sales in that range, you know, 700, 600, 700, 1000, depending if it goes up to 300,000, maybe in premium or um, in gross, and it's all based on gross sales. Um, and then if you get into the private label, like I have one that was 1.3 million in gross sales, it was higher risk. I had to go to a specialty market and that premium was 3,500. So when we have to go to the higher risk, if you're in that category, um, there's a minimum premium on those policies. And usually it's 2,500 to 3,500 minimum premium. Um, and then up from there. So, and that's like the, th that's equal to like <laughs> two sessions with a lawyer. <laughs> so if you, yeah. could, if you, if you literally put that into perspective for the people that are listening out there, like, oh, wow, if you are high risk and you are, um, you know, could potentially have higher risk to be facing uh, lawsuits for whatever reason, ingestibles and uh, topicals and, and baby category, you know, things like that major recall categories that, that you've already mentioned. Um, you know, you're going to expect to pay a pretty penny for that. How, and that's a yearly rate. That's not a monthly rate. And it also, is, it, you were saying it's based on gross sales. So if you have lower gross sales and you're not in high risk categories in the moment, you know, thinking, thinking about those specific things, then your premium is most likely going to be you know, between 700, $700 and fourteen hundred dollars for the year, and if you think about that, that is a small price to pay. Um, if you get sued, that could literally be your very first lawyer bill, and you wouldn't want to um, have to deal with that and just pay money that someone sues you because you can't afford an attorney and things like that. So um, let's just be real: insurance is not anything people love to pay for, but it's so, so, so important. It it really is, and you know, I would just kind of throw in here that. And I've been doing this a really long time, but I have a true passion to help other sellers, especially, you know, just women sellers or just sellers in general, whether you're starting or you, you're well established. I just want to help you be protected. I don't make a tremendous amount of money off of these policies. I do it because I really, truly care. And that's just my, you know, we've been around for 97 years in our agency. That's how we operate. Um, we, I'm not a hard push. I just think you need to be in compliance with Amazon and um, and protect yourself. But, um, you know, these these are these are important things. If you're going to be a true business, this is a very common expense that you should incur. And the reality is that I think a lot of people that have brick and mortar um, businesses or maybe even service businesses, you know, we would never operate without contracts. We would never operate without a lease. We wouldn't have a gentleman's agreement when we sign, when we go in to lease a building that, that the, the landlord's just gonna, you know, yeah, everything will be okay. It'll be fine. And we, we just shake hands in the back door and kind of walk in. We, we have leases, we have contracts, we have all these things to protect ourselves for a reason, because in the event that these things happen, and let me be real, I have been in business a really long time. I've been in business for almost 20 years now between all of the different businesses that I've been doing, and I have yet to be sued. However, I also have been in situations where I've had a ton of stuff ruined by a leaky roof or a 
a busted water pipe and my, we have a, a cottage in Northern Michigan and um, we're there on weekends. Well, one time we came back and apparently uh, two weeks before that we had a pipe burst and it ruined the entire <laughs> bot. I mean, it's a ranch style home and it was just ruined every single thing that was on the ground with two and a half inches of water everywhere. And it was a nightmare. And although that's not business, we were like, oh, we're so glad that we have insurance and it covers things like this. And, you know, dealing with that is never fun, but we know for sure that everything that was ruined in there and, and, and the structure and the cleanup was all taken care of very promptly. And we were very happy about that. So if you've never had an insurance claim, I'm so grateful for you. But when you, when you do have one, when I say when, because everybody at some point goes through something where they need to call insurance, whether it's homeowners, your car, your business, um, you're very grateful in that moment that you have coverage and you start scrambling to be like, okay, what's covered and what's not covered. And you kind of hope everything is because you're, you're just, it's, it's a very stressful time, whether it's, whether you're being sued or whether a, the roof is ripped off of a warehouse and all your stuff flies away. It's still a very difficult time in, yeah. in life or business to be able to deal with a loss like that and to have proper insurance just brings so much more relief. Exactly. And, and I'll just um, also say that we have um, our, we have a staff of around 30 individuals in our office here in Owensboro, Kentucky. And our claims manager is a very long term. She's the one that got me started selling on, on Amazon. So she is, you know, she handles all of our claims in the event that you do have a claim. And she is um, very versed in, in e-commerce and Amazon. Um, so she's the one that got me started in it. And yeah, it's, it's been just kind of a, a whirlwind since. So now is there any, I was going to ask, is there any other types of insurance that people need besides this liability? If they're, if they're considering other things for their business, I mean, is there a gap at all between, um, you know, say I'm shipping in product and then it, it, Amazon is responsible once they receive it, but like between me and them is that, does UPS pick up the liability in between? Is that my, my responsibility? Someone else's? How does that work? Yeah, usually with the, with the UPS and FedEx, most people I would assume use UPS because the rates are so cheap on, um, when you're fulfilling a, um, doing a fulfillment or a replenishment. But, you know, they cover it in, when it's in their care, custody and control again. If you're doing a whole truckload, you would also want to make sure that you have some cargo coverage included in that contract. And typically it's by, you know, whether it's the trucking company or a third party um, contractor or courier, you would, they would include that coverage. So those are things just to always look for in your contract. And of course, you know, if I have your insurance or even if I don't, if you had a contract and you, you know, in that situation, you wanted me to review it, I'd be glad to do that and just say, you, you have what you need or, you know, they don't have this in here. You might want to ask for this or I can always sell additional coverage. Now, one of the other coverages um, that I sell quite a bit of um, is the ocean cargo. And if you're working with, you know, if you're private labeling, you can be working with your, um, oh, in China. Freight company. Yes, your freight company, um, those sorts of, of contracts. And, um, you know, they can include that coverage or I can as well, either way. Um, so that's a, that's a coverage that we sell quite a bit of. Um, workers comp, I just wrote a work comp policy this morning for an e-commerce seller that got big enough that he actually hired, you know, had his own warehouse. So I'd already had his liability. I had his um, property coverage. And now he hired full-time employees, you know, with, you know, 300,000 in payroll, which is a big time seller in my opinion. Um, and is by your state, you're required to carry work comp. So I wrote a work comp policy. Um, we are licensed currently in about 45 states. So most likely I have your state already on our, on our books that we're um, licensed to do business. So each state is different as far as their work comp laws, but most all require workers comp. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been really, really informative. And, you know, for everyone out there, first of all, you know me and I'm tough and I'm just telling you, you are required to have insurance because you signed the terms of service to sell on Amazon. So if you don't, you need a policy and you're going to reach out to lovely Michelle and her crew and you can go to, um, cool. 
fbaquotes.com to get your uh, quote there. You can also go to emford.com and we will all put all of these things in the show notes later. Also, Michelle is a member of our Facebook group. And so if you have direct insurance questions or just general ones and you're saying, Hey, do I need this? Do I need that? She's in the Facebook group. And if you're not in the Facebook group, you can go to mommyincome.com slash join us. You need a code word. Why? Because we hate creepers and spammers and we want people to be in there because they want to be in there. So use the hashtag love because I love Michelle's name and that just sounds so fun. Um, so hashtag love and you can reach out to Michelle in the Facebook group or privately with any of these links. They're going to be below the video and or in the show notes. Again, that's fbaquotes.com, emford.com. And thank you, Michelle, so much for being here. We appreciate you. Listeners, don't forget to check out the workshop page. We've got lots of events going on this particular year. I'm excited to meet you in person. I know you could be anywhere else listening listening to any other thing right now. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon files. We'll see you same time, same place next week.